This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 427, recorded on February 3rd, 2017. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twiv. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Depommier. Hello there, Vincent. Good afternoon, Dixon. It's one degree, mostly sunny here in New York. It's actually quite a nice day, except it's quite cold. Yes. And it's about to get windier, and there's going to be some snow showers tonight. Good. Good. Excellent. Also joining us today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kathy. I should tell you the weather, and let's see. (laughs) It's 23 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And in Celsius, that's minus six. How much snow do you have on the ground? Oh, let me look. <laughs> do we have any, Dixon? Nothing. No. It's, it's about, I guess it's about three inches left yeah. at this point, three uh, to four. Okay. But it's complete, the sidewalks and streets are completely dry. Right. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Hello there, it Alan. is a bright and partly cloudy day. <laughs> Are you are you writing something? <laughs> no, no, no. no. It's, just, uh, it's about thirty four Fahrenheit, one Celsius. It's not a dark and stormy night. No, it's not a dark and stormy night. It will be. <laughs> it's going to snow tonight. That's what not, I said. Yeah. Oh, not not here. It Maybe say Sunday. Snow. Where do you get, get your weather from? Uh, Yahoo or something like that, Dixon? No, Channel Four. He gets his weather from west and of the, the Appalachian Mountains, usually. <laughs> That's, and thank you, Alan. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Tonight, mostly sunny tonight, partly cloudy with a low of minus six. There's no snow in the forecast on my... I said flurries. I heard flurries. No, there's nothing till Tuesday or Wednesday. It looks like... All right. I can't tell what the icon is. It's either rain or snow. <laughs> <coughs> Good enough. Channel 4. I haven't heard anyone say channel in years. You're so antediluvian. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. No, I have a modern television. You don't have anything modern. Yes, I do. You don't even know what the internets are? My my, my mind is modern, <laughs> Vincent. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the 27th emailer for the Emerging Infections book. Wow. These things take Jeez. a long time. I think this is the third week now. Did we have a 17th for the uh, yeah, last week Infections we, of uh, Leisure? We, we announced that last oh, okay, time. Okay, okay. And over on... Um, it's when we had a winner of the Color Atlas of Medical Bacteriology. <laughs> <laughs> How many crayons do you, you la- need for that? <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> it's a book full of pictures. No, I'm thinking about little kids coloring microbes and saying, yeah, what, right. did, what did you make cholera? <laughs> oh, I mean, we, we color, color me, plague. But... Color Me Infected was the title. <laughs> color Me Infected. Color Me Infected. Yeah. yeah. I want to tell you about the ASM, uh, ASM elections. Wait, before you do that, I just had a text from Rich. It's 61 degrees and partly cloudy in San Diego. <laughs> okay. Very good. He's in always. San Diego? It's all Legoland. Is that where Legoland is? No, Legoland. North of Denmark. It's in Carlsbad. Oh. There's also well, one. There are a few. Yeah, there are a few. Okay. Yeah, but the, the, home, office, in, uh, the home office is in, in the Orlando Denmark. area it's as well. Copenhagen. Okay. ASM, uh, ASM elections are here, and this is important because they're putting in place a new <laughs> government. They're going to elect the board of directors and a Council on Microbial Sciences. The Board of Directors is the governing body, and the Council on Microbial Sciences will be the advisory body. Hmm. That'll make recommendations for strategic, scientific, and programmatic direction. Uh, There'll be slots for mm, uh, not the usual governance types. For example, there'll be a slot on the BOD and and the comms for a young microbial scientist at the level of grad student, postdoc, assistant professor, or junior clinical microbiologist Mm -hmm. or equivalent. Not you, Dixon. No, I'm in the opposite end of that spectrum. Also slots uh, for members working outside the U.S. So you should vote. You have till the end of February. Put a link to the voting and also some information. What are you voting for? What's the board of directors? What's the comms, et cetera? An organizational chart. Let's see what this organizational chart looks like. So here, just so that you know, the ASIN board of directors consists of the president, the past president, a secretary, treasurer, CEO, Comms appointed representative and two comms appointed representatives. 
and the position those are all filled and appointed basically because the president and the secretary of the treasury those were all elected by the members and then the positions up for election are president elect for next year early career at large representative etc international rep and a bunch of others so that's the board of directors and then the comms is more complicated <laughs> The comms, here's the organizational chart on the comms. I don't think it fits on one page. Wow. 35 branch counselors, 27 division counselors, eight division representatives, eight program board committee chairs, academy board of governors chair, five officers from board of directors and CEO. Your results may vary. (laughs) Objects are larger than. (laughs) Not available in stores. That's right. Not available in stores. Operators. So why, when they advertise financial services, do they have to talk so quickly at the end? Because you have to tell the people what your but caveats you, are, but, but you don't want to pay for it. You don't want them to understand it. <laughs> exactly. You don't. You don't want people to hear what the actual scam is that you're running. So uh, you right, you right. put that all at the end. I'm surprised mm-hmm. they don't read that uh, from the drug inserts on the television uh, news shows. They're all about drugs for people my age. Pages and pages. Pages. I, and pages. I am amazed at some of these ads. They go possible side effects: yeah, exactly. are rash, death. heart attack, and death. That's yeah. right. I'll take two. And I said to Marlene all the time, "I'll take two. two. I'll take two. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a lot. It's it's yeah. anything that happens in the clinical trial has to be reported as a possible side effect. Exactly. Apparently, my sure, sure. my uh, my pharmaceutical wife tells me. Uh huh. Uh, we have some follow up from last week. Jenny writes: Hi, Twivers. I was glad that you discussed. The March for Science on TWIV 426, a strong public show of support for science is critical. As as a follow-up, you and your listeners may be interested in this blog post by a doctoral student in disability studies. Hmm. She raises some legitimate questions about the march, including the description of science as apolitical. One major criticism related to the intersection of the march and disability issues has been partially addressed by an updated diversity statement from March organizers. I think there are important issues to consider, and grappling with them will make the march stronger. I'm hoping for an accessible satellite march in my city so I can participate. So this is a good article and brings up a number of issues, some of which I think have been solved already because the March for Science has put up a website. They have a date. What is it, April 22nd, I think? You said it's Earth Day. Earth Day? Yes. It's a Saturday. You can have one in Ann Arbor, Kathy? I don't know, but I'm going to be in New Haven then. Oh. So... Yeah. So you can't go to Washington? Well, probably not. Mm. Dixon and I are going to go to Washington. We are. Are you going to go, Alan? Um, I haven't booked travel yet, but I'm very interested. Uh, part of um, part of the delay in booking it is that I need to know when things are actually happening. Yeah. So I know right. April 22nd, but, you know, is that in the morning, the afternoon? Uh, Alan, why don't you um, fly us down? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting <laughs> possibility. Well, for the Women's March, my wife took a 5 a.m. bus on Saturday, oh, right? And then eek. got home at 11.30 or something, so. Right. Uh, and the bus was, the, the bus broke, and they had to wait two and a half oh, hours for a God. replacement, so they got there late. And she said they just stood in the street because there was no room to walk. So <laughs> they were supposed to march and hold posters, but they couldn't move. So they Yeah, just, that's what I heard. It was just wall-to-wall people. Yeah. Almost as many as showed up for the inauguration. <laughs> way more yeah this is a good blog post it points out a number of issues and uh you know one of the things i worry about is that the response to this has been huge and i'm afraid they're going to be overwhelmed that let's the, overwhelm them that they won't be able to handle it you know there are a lot of issues when you m- handle a big assemblage of people like this and i'm looking talk- forward to seeing who the organizers are going to be which is another thing there, there are a lot of details that have not been worked out and i'm I'm anxious to see, I think a lot of people are anxious to see yeah. what the deal is and who's running the show and do these people have any experience with anything of this magnitude. Right. And I think that's going to make a big difference. Um, <clears throat> you know, if it if it looks like it's going to be really half-assed, I'll probably stay away because uh, I don't want to yep. contribute yep. to chaos. But, I agree. <clears throat> but if, it, if they get some sharp people on it and they get – at least uh, consultants who are who are familiar with the issues, um, the logistical issues. Then, uh, yeah, this could this could be a go. And I think that's also the point at which a lot of scientific societies will finally weigh in. You know, AAAS has said nothing mm. committal about this. Yeah, they've <clears throat> you know they've said yeah we're we're in favor of supporting science and we'll see what happens. Yeah, they're all in DC, um, right? Yeah, AAAS, so tri- ASM. 
Pew. ASM, and I, I don't think ASM has said anything nope. like that they're going to participate. Um, but if it if it if the organizers can really, you know, demonstrate that they have the chops to do this, then I think a whole lot of yeah. other groups will come in and um, and then it'll be OK that it'll be huge because it'll be huge and well organized. And I think the Women's March is a, an excellent example, which had, yeah, you know, people weren't able to move because it was so crowded, but it was it made an impact. And if there are satellite marches all over the country, then that's good, too. And, that you know, in fact, for the Women's nice. March, the first thing in the morning, I heard, you know, people have already marched in Australia. Right. And so uh, I think that's useful for people who maybe just can't go or don't want to be in that large of a crowd. I know there were some people who had panic attacks and things in the Women's March. So, yes, yes. Uh, it's an issue. Well, if anyone I know is organizing it, I'm not going. <laughs> Sounds like a Groucho Marxism. <laughs> now, if ASM or FASEB or AAAS get involved, they run big meetings. That would be good. Yes. But we don't know. Alan, can you take the next email, please? Sure. Christian writes, hi, TwivOM. Some comments to Twiv 426, although these are not really scientific, but touching the current political situation. The alternative National Park Service Twitter account was run by employees of the National Park Service after the administration silenced the official account, but they've handed over the account to journalists and activists due to the immense pressure to find the persons behind it. There's an interesting article mm -hmm. on this and provides a link. There is another interesting rogue Twitter account, apparently from inside the White House, although <laughs> there is, of course, no proof for that for obvious reasons and <clears throat> provides a link to the rogue POTUS staff uh, account. Um, for everybody planning to do something similar, there's an interesting description of how to set up, maintain and operate a secret Twitter account. Gives a link for that for it's scientists. <laughs> uh, well, but how to how to. Um, keep your identity from being discovered if you're mm -hmm. setting something up like this and you do not want to be identified. Right. Um, for scientists not participating in politics, there are now also scientists who think about running in politics. One of the more well-known is probably Michael Eisen, one of the co-founders of PLOS. Yes, I saw this. Mm -hmm. Who's now signing himself on Twitter as Senator PhD. Um, not going to win. And, he's not going to win. <clears throat> well, Probably not. Because the but, problem is uh, he's been blogging for years. He often gets very nasty on his blog. And all this is going to go, oh, we have a nasty person. I forgot. Yeah, that is no, <laughs> is, that is no longer a contraindication to a political career. Yeah, I uh, forgot. Very good. Yeah. So, yeah. I, um, <laughs> and, and a lot will depend. He's in California. And um, folks in California may not be thrilled with the way that their senators have been handling um, things like the Trump nominations. Yeah. So if you're in California and you haven't been paying attention, you may want to see which ways your senators have been voting on some of these issues and um, mm -hmm. whether they've bothered to take a strong stand against issues that might call for it. So he, he may be able to gain traction just as a protest candidate. Um, all right. Continuing with Christian's letter, I'm a listener for quite some time, although I am a postdoc biochemist working in cancer research. I like hearing podcasts from the Microbe TV empire quite a lot. Staying interested in broad science is important for scientists, in my view, as you otherwise would narrow down too much. Thanks for all your effort. If I'm the 27th email in the current contest on the Emerging Infections book, I would be delighted to add this to my science reading list. The weather here in Dresden, Germany is quite wintry with temperatures of minus 2 Celsius, around 28 Fahrenheit, and it's been snowing all day now. All right. Cool. Dresden. Dresden. Dixon. Yes. Anthony writes... Out of print no longer means unavailable. Buying each book used online for less than $5 total is a lot easier than trying to arrange an interlibrary loan for both me and the librarian who would have had to search and submit the request. I've not seen papers in biochemical genetics, but from the raves on TWIV, perhaps a separate standalone podcast discussing each paper <laughs> might be worth considering. <laughs> Maybe it would be organized by a course on iTunes U. Be a long podcast. It would be a long podcast, yes. a very long podcast. So he sent a picture of his Amazon cart. I didn't include it, but he bought readings of mammalian cell culture for 33 cents. <laughs> now, one cent, and papers in biochemical genetics for 33 cents. Right. A penny. It's so yeah. sad that these books go for a penny. What wow. can I say? 
So anyway, this kind of inspired today's pick, our paper that we're going to do. Uh-huh. I thought we should do an old paper. Yeah. Um, a Kat, blast from the past. A blast from the, something when you were young, Dixon. I was middle aged by then. Seventy six. <laughs> I was, you know, I was just 30, uh, six years. Old. I just started grad school. It was in my second year, I, I think. Thirty six years. Old. Uh, Kathy, can you take Trudy's, please? Sure. Trudy writes, "Dear Twivoids, I'm writing this email in response to your discussion on Twiv four twenty six about whether there are any viruses that require an intermediate host for replication. My gut answer would be no." but I can't help but speculate a little about the Bracovirus replication cycle. The story of the relationship between the Bracovirus and the Braconid parasitoid wasp is told beautifully by Rich Condit on TWIV 179, Mm -hmm. and I believe there is another discussion about this virus on a more recent episode, but I can't remember which one. The relationship is a unique symbiosis which has existed for about 100 million years. Genetic analysis suggests that at some point the virus infected the wasps, integrated into the wasps' genome, and since then is only vertically transmitted to offspring as an integrated provirus. The virus only replicates in specific cells of the ovary, called the calyx cells, and does so only in response to hormonal signals. The viral replication cycle consists of amplification of viral DNA, virion formation, and packaging. The viral genome package in the particles is composed of multiple double-strand DNA circles, but no structural proteins, although it does harbor immunosuppressive genes. Once the packaging has occurred, these calyx cells are lysed and the virions accumulate in the calyx lumen to form calyx fluid. Together, the wasp and the virus parasitize a lepidopteran host caterpillar. When the wasp egg is injected into the body cavity of the caterpillar along with the calyx fluid, so are the viral particles. Once inside the caterpillar, the virus doesn't really replicate, but it suppresses the caterpillar's immune system. If it didn't suppress the caterpillar's immune system, the wasp egg would be engulfed by the caterpillar's phagocytes, so the co-infection of the caterpillar with the egg and the virus together allows for survival of wasp egg in the caterpillar, leading to hatching and complete development of the immature wasp in the caterpillar. Additionally, genes expressed by the virus in the parasitized host alter host development and metabolism in order to benefit the growth and survival of the parasitoid larva. So maybe this could be one example of a virus that infects one host for one reason, parentheses, to replicate, and infects another host for another reason, parentheses, to help its symbiont. Mm. Just a thought. Kind Mm. regards, Trudy. What do you think, Dixon? Well, too much anthropomorphism here. So things happen in a random fashion, and this is an unintended consequence which resulted in the advantage. No, no, no. That's not. That's how I would put that. Last week, someone (laughs) said, you know, parasites have intermediate and definitive hosts. Yes, they do. Are there any viruses that do that? And we said we couldn't think of any, and so she submitted this as a suggestion. So wasp and caterpillar. Yeah, yeah, and that's true. But but you know, as she said, there's no replication in the right caterpillar. Yeah. So that doesn't fulfill the. uh, The rules that we have made. (laughs) No, the the pedantic rules. (laughs) (laughs) Right, pedant, pedant, pedant. no, the, the the parasitologists would say that the definitive host, and I'm sure Alan will back me up on this, harbors the sexual stage of the parasite, whereas right. the intermediate host harbors the asexual stages. So there's no sex in viruses, so <laughs> it's kind of hard to talk mm. about hosts in that sense. Mm. What is yeah, the primary to, host? You would have to warp the definitions of primary and secondary hosts yeah, yeah. in order to, um, to have any example of viruses, but I um, – a full credit to Trudy for thinking of this example, which we've even previously talked about and, yeah, yeah. and you know, gone on about and we didn't think of. Um, and <laughs> she's absolutely right that this is, yeah. I, I think, a pretty close to what you might call an intermediate and a definitive host because the replication cycle is different in these two hosts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in both not instances, just, they not just that it's that, yeah. not just that it's replicating for a particular reason, which would be anthropomorphic, but because the exactly. way in which its biology is carried out in these two different hosts is yeah. quite different. Yeah. So I, I think she's she's got a pretty good one here. Mm. I'm wondering how specific parasitoid wasps are for species of be- of uh, Lepidoptera. Also, whether you know that has a broad mm-hmm. range or a narrow yeah. range or just one on one, who knows. I don't know much about that. Mm. All right, a couple of uh, little items here for our thoughts. Uh, earlier this week, uh, the um, the Twivoids and some other individuals were having a conversation on Gmail. Um, 
around an article published uh, earlier in the t- January 31st uh, entitled, um, this is an op-ed, A Scientist March on Washington is a Bad Idea by Robert S. Young. Right. Who opens uh, saying, talk is growing about a march for science in Washington. It is a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, New York Times op-ed. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I mean, he's a scientist, and he's got an opinion. Yeah. It's very well, he, unusual. So he, he's a coastal geologist, right. and uh, he uh, he has no question that the proposed march will make his job more difficult, increase polarization. He doesn't shy away from openly presenting the facts, but he gives an example. He co-authored a report for North Carolina's Coastal Resources Commission that said sea levels along the coastline could rise uh, 39 inches by the end of the century. It was based on good science. It alarmed real estate and other economic development interests. They attacked the report. The commission ignored it. We were slandered. <laughs> and the legislature passed a law that barred state and local agencies from developing regulations or planned documents anticipating a rise in sea level. And <laughs> Stephen Colbert said, this is a brilliant solution. If your science gives you a result you don't like, pass a law saying the result is illegal. <laughs> exactly right. Yes. It's brilliant. And let all of the uh, governing body buy their summer homes right on the shore. Yes, they, they literally tried to call back the sea. <laughs> it's crazy. Isn't um, it? I, I think, you know, this is, a, this is an opinion of somebody who got burned mm-hmm. um, yeah. because of a really toxic political situation in his state. And yeah, he's, you know, he's in a bad position and that's unfortunate. I don't think that that speaks to anything about whether a scientist's march on Washington is a good or a bad idea. I Correct. I, I agree. agree with you. I mean, he says, don't march, but do your thing locally. You know, march in local groups, privately, make contact with Americans who don't know scientists, and give them your email or your phone number. Yeah. Let them see you. You know, we do that here on Twitter, right? We're reaching out to, we're saying, we're scientists, listen to us. But I think the march is a great idea. I'm sorry. Yeah, he, as, as Alan great. said, he got burned, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't march. And show yeah, my my only concerns about the march are organizational. Exactly. Um, I have and concern. once those are once those are addressed um in in a clear fashion, then I think it's a go. And and I think this objection that scientists should be, you know, quiet and behind the scenes and demure or whatever uh is is self destructive. Yeah. Yeah, you had a you had a nice little quote in the emails. Here we go. Oh, did I? You did. It was actually started by Richard Condit. Who's that? Who's that? <laughs> like the guy in Legoland that looks like Solo. Today, texting us <laughs> weather this, is a, this is a wonderful quote from Alan Dove. I understand where he's coming from, but the notion that scientists can avoid taking a stand is way past its expiration date. When facts become politicized, scientists whose job is to deal in facts become dissidents whether they want to or not. Now, we can either own that role and take control of it or shirk our responsibilities and pretend it's not our problem. The latter would be double plus ungood. I just love that. It's very good. We should get this guy on the show. Why not? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> you betcha. We also involved you know, Neva Lockett. She said, March. Yep. <laughs> Neva from Buda, Texas. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's uh, that. That's very interesting. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Matt Freeman, who's been on TWIV many times. Do you remember him, Dixon? Of course I do. He... Uh, sent me a link to a uh, a release from the uh, White House, which is now in the uh, White House, ObamaWhiteHouse.archives.gov. <laughs> it's archived. Mm. It's in, released January 9th. Recommended policy guidance for potential pandemic pathogen care and oversight. Oh, my gosh. Now let me just say, I'm going to try and stay calm here. <laughs> this is abbreviated P3CO. <laughs> yes. Not C three PO. Right. P three C O. Oh my god. Potential pandemic pathogen care and oversight. How much more governmental could you get? All right. Anyway, today the well, White they House had to call it P three C O because it's a protocol. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so they released a document called Recommended Policy Guidance for Departmental Development of Review Mechanisms for Potential Pandemic Pathogen Care and Oversight, P3CO. If you adopt these recommendations, they will satisfy the requirements for lifting the current moratorium on certain life sciences research that could enhance a pathogen's virulence and or transmissibility to produce a potential pandemic pathogen, of course, which is PPP. (laughs) So basically, if and the document 
is directed at federal governments and uh, departments and agencies conducting, supporting, or planning to conduct or support the creation, transfer, or use of enhanced pathogens of pandemic potential. They have to develop review mechanisms aligned with those recommended by the NSABB back in May 2016. And once you do that, then these experiments can proceed. All right. Now, so basically this lifts the uh, moratorium on gain-of-function research, mainly with flu and MERS viruses corona, and other coronaviruses. But um, um, it, it's really, it makes the whole thing broader. You know, this basically doesn't identify organisms. All it says is uh, potential pandemic pathogen Experiments that may lead to the development of potential pandemic pathogens have to be reviewed uh, by, by uh, these agencies. And they define, this is this is just... I hate this document. I hate the whole moratorium. This document is ridiculous. I think it's ill-advised. I think the people who started this are ill-advised and many other negative things I can say. Listen, a potential p- pandemic pathogen satisfies both of the following. One, it's likely highly transmissible and likely capable of wide and uncontrollable spread in human populations. And there's the key word there is likely. Who the hell knows? Because you only have <laughs> animal model results. Second, it is likely highly virulent and likely I've to cause seen you this animated. <laughs> significant morbidity. Uh, calm down. Sorry. I know people probably don't like it. So likely to cause significant morbidity and or mortality oh, we could, in humans. Here. And that's, again, from animal models. So this likely sure. is absurd. Sure. And I will tell you uh, what, what um, Matt Friedman wrote. He said, I was in our department seminar yesterday. The speaker was showing a mutagenesis screen he did on Pseudomonas where he identified insertions that increased pathogenicity and became antibiotic resistant. He showed in mouse models that the bugs grow to higher CFUs, outcompete wild-type pseudomonas, and this is a BSL-2 bug with experiments in a BSL-2 normal mouse facility. I sat there in awe thinking, why isn't this a gain-of-function issue right. while mouse-adapting MERS is? just I just don't understand. <laughs> but by the new policy, I think this exact experiment would be called into question, right? And he's absolutely right, because yeah. there's no organism indicated on these policies right so um and they're they're also so there's p3co and there's dual use research of concern and i'm a little unclear on what they're doing with the dual use research of concern or how they're defining it because they just say that they want hhs to continue to evaluate the the dirk policies so maybe there's going to be something else coming down the pike as well I just made a new title for this episode. Help me, P3CO. You're my only hope. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not how it went, but it's close you, know how you get it. So, I mean, I'm glad that the the uh, moratorium can be lifted. I don't think we need more guidelines and review. Every proposal for recombinant DNA modification of organisms is reviewed at the institutional level. We have an institutional biosafety committee here, and now we have a part of the meeting that we have every month. Are there any dual research, dual use research of concerns going on here at Columbia? No. Okay, let's go to the next item. So if there were, we would review it. They can't get it out to the NIH before it's reviewed here. Then the NIH would review it. The the, uh, study section would, and then internally, why do we need another layer of review? This is just to satisfy the people who made a lot of noise, like Mark Lipsich and uh, the guy at Rutgers, whose name is, is escaping me, and the guy in Paris, whose name is escaping me. <laughs> Everybody's name except Mark's is escaping me. They made a stink based on the H5N1 experiments. And and, uh, and Osterholm. Osterholm. Yeah. And, you know, we tried as much as we could to speak out, but no one listened. Just a and minute. Now this, we're, this is about growing the economy and creating jobs. Are you against that? Yeah. You have more people doing less? Come on. It's better than building a pipeline. I'm not actually mad, but I am disappointed. Uh, I think this is uh, ridiculous. The whole pause was ridiculous. And uh, I'm I'm very sad that this is happening to science. And uh, more more regulations are not what we need. Another way of looking at it, though, is that the policy is so broadly and vaguely written Mm -hmm. that it's it's going to be up to the scientific community to decide when it applies. So really, you know, likely to spread, likely to be highly pathogenic. Well, your honor, you know, I object. 
Is that is that <laughs> it's likely? Crazy. It's crazy. No, we don't have to review that because it's not likely. Oops. So it's really, I, I think, in a sense, it's kind of punting it back to the scientific community. I it's just so. a question of who in the scientific community is going to be making those calls and whether they're going to take uh, wh- where where they're going to take that policy. Yeah. So these these com- these agencies are obviously going to have to have committees of in part scientists. They won't all be scientists. Maybe maybe they'll be lawyers or in. And other kinds Maybe. of people there, but they'll have to review the science and hopefully, you know, I just don't know. So you have a, a mouse that you make a, a pseudomonas that's more virulent. Oh, we, we can't do these experiments because it's, it's theoretically possible. So then you're not going to do any experiment. Well, no, I think it'll just mean you'll, when you're writing that grant, you'll have to, um, you'll have to include a couple of paragraphs about what are the risks? What are the benefits? What are you doing to mitigate the risks? And I hope so. so. So they can look at it and say, well, you know, it looks like these researchers have done their due diligence and we're going to go ahead and approve this. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's okay if it's not going to be included in the 12 page limit. Yeah. <laughs> because that just yes. takes up space no, from the actual experiment. It's got to be somewhere. More stuff to do for no reason. How, other than to appease a few individuals who didn't understand the experiments and their benefits. And I think that's really sad. Here's a kind of wild idea. The current administration says that for every new regulation, two yes. old ones have right. to go away. So maybe There's this one. one could go yes. away <laughs> and the pause one could go away and then some new regulation could come in. But then what we fear is what's that new regulation. So. Yeah. Well, no, just the next time HHS needs to do a regulation, which happens several times a year, um, they could get rid of this and the pause. Yeah. So, so Alan, you know about politics. So this, a little bit. this document was issued by the White House, and now it's archived. Does that mean the, the regulation is archived, too, and you don't have to follow it? What, uh, no. what enforces it? How is it enforced? Uh, it's not a law, right? This this is a recommended uh, yeah so that's an important point a recommended policy guidance um so this is not this did not go through the regulatory process mm-hmm. um uh pause for a moment for a civics lesson uh you can you can pass a law through congress and that become you you pass you know legislation through congress that becomes a law uh courts can make um judicial decisions and that interprets the law the executive branch can issue regulations and those become laws. And the executive branch, which is acting here, is issuing this regulation. HHS is in the executive branch. Uh, they're under the Secretary of Health. And the normal regulatory process from that is that they would publish in the Federal Register a detailed specification of the proposed rule. Mm-hmm. Um, they'd issue what's called a notice of proposed rulemaking and say, okay, we're going to require X, Y, Z. Um, and now we would like to hear your comments. And then there's a comment period right. where people can, anybody can submit comments. Um, and then they have to answer those comments. Um, now they can group them and say, okay, 27 people said essentially this argument. And now we're going to answer that argument. Um, or they can modify the policy or they can rethink and say, OK, well, actually, we saw your comments and we realize this isn't a good idea. Mm-hmm. So that whole process has to happen for this to be legally binding. What we have right here is essentially a statement issued by uh, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, which it's not even clear that that office is going to continue to exist, frankly. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. <laughs> this is the office that advises the, pre- the president on policy or did advise the previous president on policy. And um, they're saying, here's our recommendation. Here's the basis of our recommendation. It comes out of this NSABB meeting and these other meetings and discussions that we had. Um, and um, they're recommending this approach. So that's the document that's linked here, the PDF document that you can download is their recommendation. So essentially, there's still a, a moratorium, and we have to wait for the current administration to see if they will continue this, right? I'm not sure about that. This mm-hmm. may actually list, lift the moratorium because the moratorium was handed down as an emergency measure and did not go through the yeah, regulatory yeah. process. So that was um, when this whole thing blew up 
in the press and Obama stepped in and said, okay, uh, pause this research. And HHS said, all right, even if you were already funded to do research on uh, highly pathogenic flu, um, you got to stop those experiments and we'll let you know when you can start. I think this may undo that pause. Okay. I'm not certain yep. of that. Okay. I'd, I'd need so a lawyer I, to. I, I know if someone in Tony Fauci's office, I'm going to email him and ask him, go. and next week yeah. we'll get an answer. How's yes. that? That would be great. Sounds definitive. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about something more pleasing. Okay. Food. Yes. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone and support a more sustainable food system, set the highest standards for ingredients, and build a community of home chefs. They deliver seasonal recipes with fresh, high-quality ingredients so you can make delicious home-cooked meals. They come with an easy recipe card. It'll take you 40 minutes or less to make a meal. If you spend a lot eating out or at high-end grocery chains, you'll save money, less than $10 per person for healthy home-cooked meals. They have very high quality standards for the food. They have over 150 local farms, and they source fish, beef, chicken, and pork from responsibly uh, raised animals. They have produce sourced from farms that practice regenerative farming. What's that, Dixon? Um, They believe in recycling, whatever they can. Hmm. It means if you cut off part of the farm, it grows back. There you go. (laughs) There you go. It's a stem cell farm. And because they ship exactly what you need, they're reducing food waste. They give you everything you need except salt, pepper, and oil. Right. Everything else, they give you spices, exact amount. It's all measured out, too. Wonderfully wrapped, beautifully frozen pieces of meat and fish. They have vegetarian things, too. And you can order every week or every other week, whatever you want. You can order whatever you want to eat, meat, vegetarian, whatever. And no weekly commitment. And they deliver to 99% of the U.S. And they do not repeat their recipes within a year, so you're not going to get bored. You're not going to remember what you ate now, a year from now, Dixon. I know that. And I'm looking at you. <laughs> you're looking at me? Now listen to some of the more recent recipes. Cashew chicken stir fry with tango mandarins and jasmine rice. Roasted pork with apple, walnut, and farro salad. Crispy baramundi with quinoa and roasted carrot salad. And finally, udon noodle soup with miso and soft-boiled eggs. Getting hungry, Dixon? All the time. (laughs) (laughs) Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twiv. Blueapron.com slash twiv. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. I have to admit, I don't have to admit, but I have to tell you, I have to tell you, I tried out several of these yeah. in advance of taking on the ads and boy they're pretty easy and delicious and they look great there you go I, was, I think I cooked one and I sent everyone a picture of it except <laughs> you Dixon because you don't know how to text so I don't bother sending you texts isn't that correct um, yeah I think he did send us pictures yeah, yes I think I got some pictures no, no, Dixon uh, doesn't read texts when I send him texts texts I should have taken pictures of the, the two that I did this week. What'd you do? What What did you have? Um, the the glorified cheesesteaks. The um, <laughs> I forget what they called it, but it was a, a Mexican spiced uh, steak that you fry up and and you do this um, uh, this thing that looks like you bought it at a high end uh, uh, pub. You know, it's it's this nice sandwich that. <clears throat> um, and that was very popular. It went over very well. And I saved the recipe so we can duplicate that. Um, and then just last night, we had the Thai chicken with noodles, nice. um, which was which was pretty good. I don't, I don't know if we'll do that one again, but it was it was nice. It's pretty easy to do, isn't it? It's easy and it's fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a nice deal. Good. All right. I thought we would do a classic, a classic paper today. <laughs> It's inspired by our little discussion last week. Now and then, let's do a classic. Sure. Which means, okay. so what is a classic, an old paper? <laughs> it could be contemporary classics. Although, I don't know, I haven't seen a paper in a, in a long time that I would say is a classic, right? Right. It's hard well, to, it takes time to figure out, yeah, to figure right. out if it's a classic. It's true. It does right. take true. time, so by definition... <laughs> it has to be this paper is oh this paper I've read many times it is from February 1976 published in the days when publishing was 
much more innocent than it is today. It's in the <laughs> Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The title is Order of Transcription of Genes of Vesicular Stomatitis Virus. It's by L. Andrew Ball and Carol N. White. And they are at the uni- they were at the time at the University of Connecticut in Stores, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. 1976. Let's see. UConn. I w- yeah. UConn. Uh, I- 1976. I was a, I think, second year graduate student. Um, cloning was just getting started. Sequencing, the first viral genome was sequenced in 1976. Um, there was no PCR, no deep sequencing. Um, I don't know. We had it was Western. Jonathan Beckwith, wasn't it? Wasn't he the first one no. to clone a gene? The, to e. clone a gene? E. coli. No, I didn't say clone. The first, I said sequence the first sequence. genome. Oh, sequence the first That genome. was actually a phage, MS2, an <laughs> RNA phage. Okay. And then the next year was Phi-X by Frederick Sanger. Um, so it was early days of recombinant DNA. Not a lot of fancy schmancy techniques by today. I was standards. a I was a second year elementary student. I was a teacher <laughs> here. I was a first year graduate student. Yeah, you and I are in sync. Oh, I yeah. said second year. When yeah, did I start said- graduate school? I started in seventy five. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, oh. seventy five. So you're a first year student. He's a first year student. So I probably didn't even read this paper, but I used to do this paper with my classes year after year because it's a classic. It's a classic. I I read this paper when I was a second year student. (laughs) Yeah, right here. (laughs) In in Vincent's class. And you you used to teach it to your (laughs) classes as well, Kathy, right? Yep. Yep. So here's the state of the situation. Vesicular stomatitis virus. uh, And Kathy knows well because she did a... Uh, postdoc in in a lab, or you, you were a PhD, PhD. in John Holland's lab, right? But I wasn't in the lab at the time this paper came out. I was working on PhiX at the time. And, I was working on PhiX when its sequence oh, came out. Oh, cool! And and were they working on VSV in in the Holland lab at the time? Oh, of course. Yeah, yes. but you weren't, right? Yes. So VSV is a rhabdovirus that people used to use. They still do a lot because uh, the other rhabdo is rabies, and it's just dangerous. So you might as well work with this one. Uh, it's a Envelope virus with a single negative strand of RNA. Now, what I love about the first sentence of this paper, they give you the molecular weight of the RNA, three to yeah. three to four million, and they would never do that anymore. They would tell you the exact length and bases, right? Because now we have that for all the genomes. So at the time, we knew uh, a big negative strand RNA. It codes five viral proteins, and uh, there are five m- mRNAs in the infected cell. Okay, so you have a negative strand RNA. Uh, This has to come into the cell with a polymerase to make mRNAs because the cell cannot copy the negative strand to make mRNAs. So the question here in the field at the time is, how are these mRNAs made? Are they made as a precursor, which is then cleaved up, or are they all made by individual initiations on the negative strand template? Now. And it's tempting to say <laughs> that they'd be made as a single precursor because that would also provide an obvious mechanism for replicating the genome. Exactly. Because right. the virus is going to have to make a plus strand copy of this negative strand genome in order to template the new genomes. So it's going to have to make a full length version. Yeah. And it's also going to have to translate that RNA. Um, so wouldn't it be nifty if it just, you know, River, it, it just produces the, the entire plus strand and then cuts some of it up to translate and leaves the rest of it intact to package. Um, but that's all theoretical at this point. So the title of this should be Hindsight is 2020. That's because you all know all of this. This is like child's play. High school students. You don't want us to stuff. discuss this? Oh, I do, of course. The origins of our knowledge starts with these classics. <laughs> yes. No, but... You, I mean, you're saying how primitive because they don't even start with the sequence. No, I didn't say it, took it was a long primitive. time. <laughs> I didn't say it was primitive. This yeah. was the, uh, I'm trying to tell everyone what the custom of the day well, was. I know the someone. State of the art. Yeah. I know the someone who art. got a Nobel Prize for sequencing the IgG molecule. Who was that? Right. Gerald Edelman. He was crazy. He certainly was. Yeah. He probably still is. <laughs> so to, to the point is that to, I could sequence the IgG molecule today. <laughs> right. But. So to get back to another way of stating the question, it was to determine whether the genes were transcribed independently or whether transcription initiates at only one point on the genome. Right. 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 And interestingly, they used a cell-free system to answer the question. Yes. That's right. And and a great, a great, great thing about reading these classic papers is even if you're not up to date on, 
uh, what's going on in science these days or you're not willing to wade into one of these um, these horrifically dense papers like some of the ones that we've covered where it's got, it's got 3,000 experiments, it seems like, <laughs> packed into this incredible space. Um, a lot of these classics, you look back at them and you say, it's so simple. It's right. so elegant, the approach that they took and they, yeah. and they, they found out something fundamentally new at the time. And so that's what we're going to go into. So as Dixon said, they use a, a in vitro transcription translation system. And the key approach here is ultraviolet irradiation, which at the time is known to produce thymine or uracil dimers in RNA. And transcription or the mRNA synthesis would be blocked at, a, right. at such a dimer. Right. So you can irradiate the genome and then ask, what's the target size? Because the bigger the RNA, the bigger the target size, you need less UV to, to hit it in, in effect. And so that's, it's a beautifully simple thing, but it works. Right. Yeah. Right. And again, to restate it, if the genes are transcribed independently, the sensitivity of each gene to UV irradiation should be proportional to the size of the gene. Right. Right. And if transcription initiates at only one point and the messenger RNAs are synthesized by read-through and processing then the sensitivity of a gene will depend strongly on its position in the genome, right. since its target size will include all proximal genes. Sounds like you're reading from your notes when you're teaching, Kathy. <laughs> no, I'm reading right from the paper itself. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> but the papers are... Because they are, say it so well. <laughs> well, Andy Ball, as you'll see a bit later, is a very, very good writer. Uh, he writes very clearly. And so his papers are always wonderful to read. They make a lot of sense. You know, clear writing is not just... The ability to write, but it's to put your thoughts yeah. in an organized way on paper, and not all of us can do that, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's you know some of us have good grammatical skills, but we can't organize our thoughts. And I, I notice you're nodding, Dixon. So. I do because you know when I was on the study section at NIH, that the best written grants were usually the grants that got funded <laughs> because you understood them. There was yeah. no ambiguities, right? Yeah, I, I think some people can't write, and they have difficulties getting funded. There was one guy, his name was Jack Remington, and he wrote remarkable grants, I mm -hmm. would say. Not just good grants. They were fabulous grants. They were wonderful reads. I, I, totally, I love that. Isn't yeah, it? me too, me too. And then there are the tortured ones yeah. that you can't get through <laughs> yeah. a sentence without stopping and saying, what the heck does exactly this mean? Exactly <laughs> right. What I was amazed at was some of those grants got funded also. <laughs> like the science is compelling enough, right? Yeah. It can be. <laughs> the best one we had in our entire study section, though, was a grant reviewed by John Mans Maysfield. He stood up and said, this grant sucks. He says, oh, and by the way, it's about hookworm. Because <laughs> <laughs> hookworm sucks your blood. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I, I get it. <laughs> uh, now, here they, they grow VSV, they purify it, and then they... they add a little bit of detergent to just crack it open, and they add nucleotides and amino acids. So what is going to happen, there's a polymerase in the particle that's going to make mRNAs, and then they're going to be translated. And so that's the system they'll use. They're going to shine UV light on the virus, do this in vitro transcription translation, uh, and then measure the output. By the way, may I take a pedantic pause? Please. Um, Kathy, is it okay? Of course. <laughs> the title, Order of Transcription. Um, transcription, historically, is the production of mRNA from DNA templates. Now, when RNA viruses came along, they adopted this word. And uh, in the first edition of our textbook, I remember Jane Flint horrified <laughs> at the use of transcription <laughs> for this process. So we, we don't use it in our textbook. We call it RNA dependent RNA synthesis, not transcription. So I, I, I have a pain in my chest every time I say transcription here because it's okay. wrong. Okay, and the way that the rest of us look at it is the production of messenger RNA from a template can be considered transcription. Right. And well, but it was originally defined as DNA based. That's what her because was. that's the only way that people thought about it. Yeah. I don't well, think that they were the so. Her I don't point think is, they were so strict as to say it can only be a messenger RNA production from a DNA template. I, I doubt if there was a... a well, why don't you go argue with Jane? Go argue. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't wanna, I don't need to. One does not, does not argue uh, flippantly with Dr. Flint. 
anyway, back to transcription. You uh, <laughs> so the first figure is basically a um, a graph of the incorporation of of radioactivity into the RNA and the protein showing that there's a lovely incorporation. You make a lot of RNA. You make mRNAs. You make protein in this system. Uh, and then they run they run the proteins on a protein gel. They re- use a tube gel. You remember those? Who could forget? <laughs> you put a yes. polyacrylamide in a tube because sure. we yes. didn't have slabs at the time. That's right. Did, yes. you, did you do those, Kathy? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I have to tell Guilty. you because they did dual labeling in some of these experiments with tritium and C14 right. that I did that. And that gives you a way of looking at the radioactivity that you can't do with just a film. That's right. And so we right. had this bank of single edge razor blades mm-hmm. all screwed together. Right. And you would freeze your gel. Right. And then cut it apart into and slices. then p- pick out each little slice with forceps and put it into a scintillation vial and count the tritium and the C14. Right. That's right. And uh, th- they do the two isotopes because the tra- the uh, translation products in vitro are alert- labeled with tritium. And then they have some authentic viral proteins labeled with C14. So they can say, ah, we're making viral proteins uh, in right. vitro. They, they spike those in as markers. Right. Now, the, the cool thing about this, when I used to discuss this paper, I used to talk about the spillover between the tritium and the C14 channels on the <laughs> scintillation <laughs> counter. Yes. I can picture it on the on that thing that stuck into the scintillation counter. They had that little diagram. That's right. Yep. Because these two isotopes, are, you know, they're they're pretty distinct, so that's how you can measure them separately just by counting the emissions. But there is a, an overlap, and you have to subtract it; otherwise, you're going to get in trouble. But we don't need to, to worry about this anymore. It's all um, acrylamide over the dam, so to speak. Now, interestingly, in this paper, they also do slab gels because figure one of the subsequent figures is this figure three is a slab gel of the actual experiment. So it's kind of curious that they did uh, both, but I think you can't do the the tritium C fourteen spiking in a slab format, right, Kathy? I guess you could cut the slab up, but it's easier sure. to do a, a tube yeah. gel. So the way they do this is they put VSV in a, in a plate uh, and shine UV light on it. And you have to have a thin layer of fluid because if it's too thick, the UV light won't get through. They have a little stir bar in it to keep it moving. And then they have the light at a certain distance away. And that's how they control the dose of UV uh, that it's getting because there's no other way to control the lamp. We used to have these UV lamps all the time. I remember them. They were black and uh, had these metal stands. You know, it was just very funny. So you radiate for different amounts of time uh, and then you uh, do a transcription translation and of course the, the the brilliant part of this is that you can irradiate the virus and do an infectivity assay and measure the inactivation of infectivity by uv light you know the size of the rna genome so you can calibrate the inactivation immediately based on infectivity right and uh so basically that and one of the things i always used to tell students is they 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 do this experiment, they run out gels, and you can see how different the different viral proteins have different sensitivities to inactivation by UV light, so they have different targets. And then they have to calculate the target size, uh, and they say the UV dose is corresponding to 37% survival, and they give it for each of the proteins, the viral proteins. And I used to say to the students, why are they telling us 37%? What's so magic about that number? And I don't even think Alan Dove knew at the time. <laughs> no, I don't think I did. <clears throat> the key is that that is what you get for a single hit. When you get a single hit, like in multiplicity, if you infect cells with a multiplicity of one, 37% of them are uninfected. Ah. So 37% survival co- corresponds to a single hit on average of UV on the templates. And that's the magic of that number. And um, so they can calculate this for each of the um, proteins based on the infectivity of the genome and its target size. So the genome is, you know, 3.8 million uh, Daltons. And the target size, you know, they they give it in ergs per millimeter, right, which is how much UV they put on. Uh, And then they can uh, look at the target size for each of the other one and see if they're as predicted. So you could predict their target size uh, based on the genome, because we know their size re- relative to the genome. And then you, he, they make curves in uh, figure four, which are the predicted and the actual data uh, for each protein. And the surprise is 
That and has- predicted, predicted meaning um, if these were individual pieces of RNA that you were hitting. Yeah, so they do both. Uh, they do individual pieces of RNA, and then they put the data on, and the data don't line up for other than the first protein, the uh, the end protein. The, all the others, the target size is not equivalent to the size of the uh, mRNA, but rather to the mRNA plus the size of the mRNA in front of it. And uh, that's the beauty of this. That's it. The idea was that the polymerase starts at one end and transcribes them all because it's a, it's a, the target sizes of the first protein is equal to its own target size of the mRNA, but the last one is equal to the sum of all the ones in front of it. So it must be right. made as a precursor. And this also <clears throat> reveals the order in which these genes must be encoded. That's right. Because that when you can't sequence the RNA, was a big question as well. Yeah, so you can have the target size, and you can shuffle them in different ways and say, oh, this is the way it must, this is the way the order must be. So that that's a beautiful outcome of this paper. And uh, then, really, the, the question is, um, there's still a couple of possibilities for how these mRNAs are made. Or is a big precursor made, and it's chopped up? Or is there an obligatory order of transcription. You start at the first gene, you make it, you, and then you make the second, and then you make the third, fourth, etc. An obligatory order. And the authors of this paper favor the cleavage of a precursor because they look at the five prime end of the mRNAs and they say, you know, what's there is likely to be a result of cleavage. Unfortunately, they were wrong. Sure, <laughs> many years later, there's actually an obligatory sequence. The polymerase starts at one end, it makes an mRNA, it stops. And then it initiates again and makes a second mRNA. It does this start-stop thing all the way down the genome in an obligatory sequence. You couldn't have designed this that way. I think that you wouldn't was, have designed this this way. If I had designed it, I would make it a positive strand virus. Yes, much simpler. <laughs> now, um, it, it, it may sound short, but you know this is a lot of work. So I actually emailed uh, Andy the other day. I wanted to know. Uh, you know, where was he in his career? And he sent back a paper. Are you there, yes. Kathy? Kathy, <laughs> yes, are you there? I'm here. Yes. It has. How far down are you now in the paper? <laughs> it has 19 references. Yes. I wonder if he just whipped this off or if he had it somewhere, you know. It almost sounds like something he might have had, but yeah. So I think I'd like to read it and we'll take turns reading it. And Dixon, you're going to read all the references, okay? Absolutely. <laughs> all 19. Start looking them up. Good to hear from you. I'm honored to be the author of a classic and will try to remember some of the context from about 40 years ago. It doesn't seem real. What follows is probably much more than you need, but hear what you want to hear and disregard the rest. The common thread, such as it is, is the love of a biochemist for cell-free systems. In 1969, after finishing a not very satisfactory PhD in biochemistry at Oxford, only one paper, and that published several years after I graduated, reference one, where I worked on the structure of E. coli ribosomes using biophysical techniques, analytical ultracentrifugation, and solvent perturbation spectroscopy. I came to the U.S. as a postdoc to join join Paul Kaysberg Lab at University of Wisconsin-Madison in what was then the biophysics lab and is now the Institute for Molecular Virology. I had basically picked Paul's lab with a pin, knowing little about what he did or Madison or Wisconsin, or anything, a real shot in the dark. But for me, it was the dawn of molecular biology, which had not really reached Oxford in the late 60s. Professor Hans Krebs was chair of the biochemistry department there when I began my PhD, and intermediary metabolism ruled. I remember Paul Kaysberg's initial instructions to me, go to the library and do some reading, (laughs) then find a problem and work on it. (laughs) Not having a clue... By the way, that's kind of the same instructions John Holland gave me when I joined his lab. Yeah, it's Do some reading, common. talk to the people in the lab, and figure yeah. out something to work on. Yep. Ah, we don't do that anymore. We kind of handhold people. Oh, well. Not having a clue what to do, I befriended Harold Jokush, a German postdoc in Paul's lab. And together we began to work on Q-beta phage reference too. We compared the viral proteins made in vivo and by selfie translation and isolated several amber and ochre mutants that gave us some insight into the rudimentary mechanism of control of gene expression, reference 3. I was already fond of prokaryotic cell-free protein synthesis, having translated poly-U 
using unfolded, refolded E. coli ribosomes in Oxford, an experiment that didn't make it into my thesis. But the ability to translate an authentic mRNA, the Q-beta RNA genome, raised it to another level and cemented my affection for the power of cell-free systems. I owe Harold more than he will ever know. He was a sort of scientist who always did the control before doing the experiment, <laughs> and he taught me experimental rigor. Apart from the science, I got my first and only to date <clears throat> whiff of tear gas in Madison. The lab was right across the street from the ROTC building, a favorite location for violent demonstrations mm -hmm. against the wars in Southeast Asia, and the lab's HVAC system sucked in the tear gas at street level and blew it out into our labs on the eighth floor. <laughs> Happy days. <laughs> Alan, can you continue? Anyway, after two very happy years in Madison, my fellowship time was up and I returned to the UK to exactly the position I wanted as a staff member at the MRC's National Institute for Medical Research at Mill Hill in London. Let's just pause for a moment to tell the younger members of the audience, yes, it was typical apparently at that time for somebody to do a single two-year postdoc <laughs> and then land their dream job. Continuing, <laughs> there I made the transition from pro prokaryotes to eukaryotes by joining the lab of Ian Kerr, who was working to elucidate the mechanism of action of interferon using cell-free protein synthesis. We used mouse ascites tumor cells to grow encephalomyocarditis virus as a source of RNA to program cell-free translation by extracts made from interferon-treated mouse L cells. We were looking for the mechanism of antiviral discrimination. Naively, I expected it to be a single mechanism that should be fairly straightforward to work out. How naive can you get? With hindsight, by the far the most important discovery from that time was the interferon-induced enhanced sensitivity of translation to inhibition by double-stranded RNA, reference 4. This observation opened a multitude of doors and led to Ian's discovery, after I'd left his lab, of the double-stranded RNA-dependent 25A RNase L system and the PKR protein kinase. I vacationed in the U.S. in the fall of 1973, visiting friends I'd made in Madison, and was lucky enough to be invited by Philip Marcus to give a seminar at Yukon Stores on the work Ian's lab was doing on interferon. I loved the atmosphere in Stores, which at that time was a sleepy rural campus set in the Connecticut countryside, surrounded by miles and miles of New England fall colors. About three months later, Phil phoned me in London and said, Well, you've got the job. Mm -hmm. One job, I said. Unbeknownst to me, he had been recruiting to fill a position on his recently funded program project grant, and my seminar visit had been a job interview. If only all job interviews could be that stress-free. Six months later, in July 1974, I left Mill Hill and moved to stores, taking up a soft money assistant professorship with no teaching responsibilities. Independence at last. God, what to do? Well, something to do with a cell-free system seemed obvious, and interferon was essential, that being the focus of the program project. But the murine interferon system seemed to be getting unnecessarily complicated, and anyway, I knew I couldn't compete directly with the powerful group I'd just left. Phil Marcus's focus was chicken interferon, which he studied in primary chick embryo cells that were aged for seven days in cell culture in a way that only Phil's lab knew how to do. I had the idea that comparing the biochemistry of the murine and avian responses to interferon might help to sort the forest from the trees. So I decided to make a cell-free translation system for primary chick embryo cells, unaware of the fact that several people had tried to do that before and failed. Often it's best to be unaware that other people have tried and failed. Um, but what to use as an mRNA? Enter another unsung hero of my scientific career, Lee Dutton. Lee was, if I remember correctly, an undergraduate student loosely attached to Phil's lab and hoping to get into graduate school, which he never did as far as I know. Lee was, quite frankly, in love with vesicular stomatitis virus, VSV. He was a true fanatic. He had read every paper ever written about it and would talk to anyone who would listen about what a marvelous virus VSV was. I knew almost nothing about VSV, which is subject to stringent containment in the UK because its initial symptoms in cattle resemble foot and mouth disease, for which there is a slaughter policy. Anyway, when I learned from Lee that VSV could make viral mRNAs in vitro, I came up with the idea of creating a coupled transcription translation cell-free system with which to study interferon action in chicken cells. Not only did the coupled system work after a bit of tweaking, but also there was a synergy between transcription and translation, and on a good day, the system continued to churn out VSV proteins for up to 12 hours, references 5 and 6. Since most other cell-free translation systems give out after one or two hours, this was truly unexpected and wonderful. My success, where others had failed with primary chick embryo cell extracts, turned out to be due to Phil's aging process. Pure luck. And like the job itself, it was luck that I was unaware of it at the time. Kathy. And <clears throat> passing. 
Okay. <clears throat> Kathy? Sorry, I was on mute. Yep. There was oh, another yeah. person without whom this work would never have been as successful as it was, Carol Norris White. Carol had graduated from UConn as a straight-A biology student in 1974 and was on her way to graduate school at Stanford, if memory serves. But romance intervened, and rather than go to Stanford and on to what I'm sure would have been a stellar research career, she chose to stay in stores and answered my ad for a technician instead. She was a delight to work with, smart, meticulous, and imaginative. Her name on the papers we published together at that time is evidence of how important she was to the various projects. I remember on the morning we were going to make our first big cell-free extracts from 12 roller bottles of chick embryo cells that had been aging in culture for seven days, six of them treated overnight with interferon, and six left untreated. Carol came into the lab looking rather pale. She'd woken that morning from a nightmare in which she had carefully made the two cell-free extracts, only to then mix them together. <laughs> only in her dreams did Carol ever make mistakes like that. At that time, Phil Marcus was running a weekly molecular virology journal club that met on Fridays at noon. It was there that I had first heard Lee Dutton singing the praises of VSV as an experimental system. Phil was a virologist of the old school and a pioneer of the early days of cell culture. For many years, he had taught the Cold Spring Harbor cell culture course. He was a devotee of the Poisson distribution and a big fan of target size analysis. He had worked with Leo Zizard at some point in his career and retained a keen appreciation of the power of radiation in all its wavelengths. <laughs> <laughs> Wikipedia notes that Cesar gave essential advice to Theodore Puck and Philip I. Marcus for the first cloning of a human cell in 1955. I wish I could remember who had presented what on the day that UV transcriptional mapping experiments were conceived, but it was during the general discussion afterwards that the idea of trying to measure the UV target sizes of the five VSV transcripts emerged. It was one of those rare magical moments when, during a discussion among several participants, an idea emerges from the group that no single participant can truly claim as uniquely theirs. This is reflected in the acknowledgement section of the PNAS paper, which reads, We thank Margaret Sakalik for doing the plaque essays, doctors. Philip Marcus, Bob Warrington, and Ian Kerr for helpful discussion, and the members of the Molecular Virology Journal Club where these experiments were conceived. However, I was in the lucky position of having the perfect system to test the idea, and I began to plan the experiments that same afternoon. Since at that time, proteins were so much easier to resolve and quantitate than RNAs, we decided to use the coupled transcription translation system, even though it was not yet published, and maybe this further contributed to the impact of the paper. I want to pause there and just, I, I highlighted that last sentence because it's just the technology at the time that couldn't analyze RNAs. So right. we'll use the translation product as a read. It's brilliant. Right Nowadays, we could look at the RNA, we could do all kinds of cool things, but that's what we had. Neat. We wanted to publish in PNAS to achieve the maximum impact, of course, but at that time you could only submit through a member of the National Academy. Luckily, Jim Darnell came to stores on a seminar visit at just the right time, heard about the work, and agreed to have it reviewed. I believe he gave it to David Baltimore to review, but maybe I just hoped he did. <laughs> anyway, there was only one serious negative comment, that I must acknowledge the work of Hackett and Sauerbeer, references 7 and 8, who, unbeknownst to me, had applied the same method to map the E. coli and mouse ribosomal RNA genes two years earlier. Were the results surprising? Well, I have always been surprised when experiments, particularly elaborate experiments, work, and this one worked unexpectedly well. We went into the experiment hoping to be able to distinguish between two extreme models, a single entry site for the polymerase to access the genome of five separate entry sites, one for each of the five genes, although intermediate models were possible, of course. Luckily, we had an independent measure of the UV target size of the complete genome, namely viral infectivity, thanks to Margaret Sakalik's plaque assays of the UV-irradiated virus. And when we found that to be the same as the target size of the L polymerase gene, we became convinced we were looking at a single entry site model. The target sizes of the other four genes fell neatly into place, demonstrating unambiguously their order of transcription and strongly implying their physical order, an implication that turned out to be correct. However, another implication, which I considered almost inescapable at the time, mm -hmm. was not confirmed. 
The discussion contains the sentence for which I take sole responsibility. We presume that the individual mRNAs are generated from the transcribing complex by cleavage of the nascent positive RNA strand, although other mechanisms can be imagined. My total failure over the next three years to find any evidence for the cleavage model of messenger RNA synthesis persuaded me to abandon VSV for the next 15 years in favor of working on vaccinia virus. My foray into vaccinia virus was influenced to a significant extent by a beautiful work that Mariano Esteban and David Metz were doing at Mill Hill as part of the interferon initiative when I was there, reference 9. I chose to focus on the thymine uh, kinase TK gene, having been impressed by the classic papers of Brian McCausland, reference 10, now there's a classic. And besides, it's such a powerful genetic system. I now had moved back to the University of Wisconsin uh, in Madison uh, to a joint faculty position between the biophysics lab and the biochemistry department. There, Dennis Urbry and I mapped and sequenced the VVKTK gene, reference 11, in competition with Jerry Weir and Bernie Moss, which they won. <laughs> because of this bidirectional selectability, the TK locus instantly became the favorite place to insert heterologous DNA when creating vaccinia virus recombinants. When Tom First and Bernie Moss showed you could express functional phage T7 DNA-dependent RNA polymerase from a vaccinia recombinant, reference 12, I couldn't wait to try it with an RNA-dependent polymerase. I remember sitting on the beach at Cold Spring Harbor after that 1986 pox virus meeting I'd finished, waiting for a cab to take me back to the airport, my mind bursting with experiments. During those few hours, I planned an entire NIH grant proposal around the idea of expressing functional RNA re replicants from a vaccinia virus recombinants. I chose the polymerase gene for the positive sense no notavirus, Flockhouse virus FHV, which I was familiar with because of the work being done in Roland Reuchert's lab on one floor below mine in Madison. Expression of the FHV RNA polymerase was straightforward. Expression of a functional template for RNA replication was not. It required the combination effort of two separate genetic elements, a T-cell transcriptional terminator and a cis-acting self-cleaving ribozyme, an idea first given to me by Josef Bujarski, reference 13. Together, these elements let us synthesize a functional template for the FHV RNA polymerase and thereby express an RNA replicon, repli reference 14. By the way, <clears throat> this is why I think that this was something he had already because of this vaccinia interlude there. <laughs> right. Right. Vaccinia was a popular virus in, in, in its heyday, right? Back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Even Rich Condit worked on it. How about that? <laughs> Should I keep reading? You could read one more paragraph. No, okay. Is that okay? Can you do it, sir? I don't know. <laughs> Try. <laughs> Will I get the job? <laughs> <Right>. <clears throat> I was eventually drawn back to VSV thanks to a very productive and fulfilling collaboration with Gail Wirtz as we worked to develop a reverse genetic system, for, you don't like that term, but that's the way it is, for the non-segmented negative strand viruses. I had collaborated for several years with Gail on various pros projects, and in 1987, when we both moved to the University of Alabama at Birmingham, we resolved to establish a cell-based VSV RNA replication system. But what worked so well for positive sense FHV RNA would, frustratingly, uh, absolutely not work for negative sense VSV DNA, RNA. Desperate, we were down to our last idea, and over a memorable lunch one day, we decided to construct a plasmid that would make the three prime end of the RNA transcript absolutely perfect with no additional nucleotides. For this, we used the recently described hepatitis delta virus ribosome, re reference 15, to perform the cis cleavage rather than the messier satellite tobacco necrosis virus ribozyme that inevitably left a few extra nucleotides at the three prime end of the transcript. In retrospect, I don't think I expected to, it to make any difference, but lo and behold, it did. At last, we could synthesize in plasma transfected cells VSV RNAs that were recognized and replicated by the VSV replication machinery, reference 16. Recovery of infectious VSV itself from a full-length cDNA clone Followed a couple of years later, reference 17. You know, it's interesting that he capitalizes low and behold. <laughs> <laughs> also, another thing to point out here was that it required the synthesis of the plus strand RNA uh -huh. to get infectivity. 
not the, many people tried the minus strand for years. Did not work. It was only for these negative strand viruses. Only the plus strand. Very <laughs> interesting. Just to put a timeline on this, the uh, reference sixteen for the uh, replication of the the first part was nineteen ninety two, and then the full length infectious cDNA clone was nineteen ninety five with Sean Whalen as the first author. Yep. All right, last paragraph. One final anecdote comes to mind. During the time Gail and I were at UAB, we held joint lab meetings and occasional whole-day lab retreats where my group's work on recombinant vaccinia virus vectors and RNA replication of the notaviruses encountered the work of Gail and her group on VSV and human respiratory syncytial virus. Out of this meeting pot, out of this melting pot, came the reverse genetic system. We held a lab retreat at our house shortly after achieving the recovery of infectious VSV for the first time to discuss what to do next. I think we all felt the jubilation of a kid in a candy store, but what to try first? <laughs> Two answers emerged. Sean Whalen's was, we should turn it into a vector, an approach that has paid huge dividends and will continue to do so. By the way, a VSV Ebola virus vaccine. Hmm? There you go. It's mm-hmm. hanging on your wall. <laughs> <laughs> My answer was, let's rearrange the genes. Why, everyone wanted to know. <laughs> I have no idea was the best answer I could come up with. I love it. But honestly, it had something to do with personal hubris and possessiveness. It was, I felt, my gene order, and therefore mine to rearrange. Boy, that's hubris. <laughs> gene rearrangement also turned out to pay unforeseen dividends in that it allows one to manipulate the phenotype in a rational and predictable manner. References 18 and 19, which I believe, is it possible? No, we didn't do those on on uh, TWIV because that's before TWIV started, yeah. But uh, rearranging the genes of VSV messes up its replication. It has a phenotype. It's not good. So it has evolved in this perfect gene order, apparently. I would have loved to have read these, um, the uh, rationale for that part of the experiment in the, in the grant that he wrote. <laughs> Why do I want to arrange could. these out? <laughs> well, I think he probably... I'll let you know after we do it. He probably had a good rationale. But, you know, sometimes experiments you do because they're interesting, but you're not sure why. They're intuitive. That's and uh, nowadays it's harder and harder to do those kinds of experiments. Well, you can do them, but you certainly can't write them in a grant proposal. Nope. You have to oh, do those with extra money. That's very nice. Thank you, Andy. And that's our classic for today. <laughs> classic. <laughs> I, I just want to point out, because I I went to my old class notes for this. In uh, So this paper came out in the February 1976 PNAS, Volume 73, Number 2, in Volume 73, Number 5, May of 1976, there was a paper from Gordon Abraham and Omeo mm-hmm. Banerjee mm-hmm. entitled Sequel Trans- Sequential Transcription of the Genes of Vesicular Stomatitis Virus. And so they submitted their paper in February, and they have in this another classic thing that we used to see in papers a lot. I, I rarely see it now. At the very end, just before the references... There is a note added in proof. Oh, yeah. While this work was in progress, we learned that Ball and White, reference 17, have come to a similar conclusion concerning the order of transcription of the genes of VSV using a coupled in vitro transcription and translation system primed by UV irradiated VSV. Yep. And the method used by Abraham and Banerjee was very similar with the UV mapping and the target size things and, and everything. So so I'm going to suggest the next time we read a classic paper, we get Cousin Brucey to read it. <laughs> why? Cousin Brucey. You don't know who Cousin Brucey Yeah, I know Brucey who he is, is, but why a classic paper? Because he was famous for playing classical rock and roll. Yeah. I hated uh, it. I hated WABC AM. <laughs> WABC AM. I hated that logo. Oh. <laughs> I, I didn't see, hate anything. I see, I see. Um, uh, yeah, bef- in proof was actually proof. You got... You got a proof of the paper, and you had to check it. To make That's sure right, it's right. Oh, Which I guess we get right. we get PDF proofs now, right? Sure. Yeah. And but you could add in there just a little note about. Oh, we do notice that somebody <laughs> else already published something very similar. Right? Yep. And acknowledge that. Yeah. Nobody does that anymore because mm-hmm. everyone yeah. wants to be first. Yeah. So they can get their grants and their jobs. Oh boy. Now let's right. read one round of email. Okay. okay. The first one's from Rich. Thank you for your comments regarding the Trump-Kennedy meeting discussed in TWIV 424. It was helpful because I was so angered when when I read about the meeting and then the, quote, tweets, unquote, that followed. 
I began to question my sanity. <laughs> All of this has direct implications for my practice of dentistry. I deal with the concepts of contagious disease on a daily basis. Flu, measles, pertussis, and the rest are a big deal when working a few inches away from patient and contagion can go both ways. Anti-vax is a big deal here in California. One never knows what one has been exposed to, as was the case at Disneyland. Mm. A special thanks to Professor Spindler for her very complete summary of Wakefield's insult to science and public health. It would be great to publish on the blog. More firepower as shaped ignorance tries to take control. Thank to you and the TWIV team and ASM for your remarkable efforts in communication. Rich. And I point out that that was the episode when Trudy was there in the TWIV studio, and she was the one mm -hmm. who gave the summary of the Wakefield vaccine story. Not I. Yeah, this was tw when we, TWIV 424, we talked about uh, Trump supposedly making a committee to investigate vaccines. Right. Chaired by Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Robert Kennedy who was an anti-vaxxer. Kennedy Jr. Brilliant. 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 Jr., sorry. Dead. Yeah, his father's dead. I know. Yeah. Alan. Casey writes, hello, I would love to win a copy of Infections of Leisure. Hope I'm number 17. Also, I wanted to send you a personalized thank you note for the TWIV mug that you sent me a couple of weeks ago for entering the Limerick contest. I absolutely <laughs> love it. In fact, I can't bring myself to use it at all because I can't stand the thought of forever tainting it with coffee stains. So it is currently <laughs> sitting on my highest cupboard shelf so I can admire it. I think, well, the one that I got, the newer one, has a dark interior, it so does. the coffee stains are not an issue. I think <laughs> and it cleans up beautifully in the dishwasher, too. Yeah, exactly. I sent that to Casey, yeah. That's the special edition, which you, uh, I gave to you, Dixon, too. You did. I treasure it. Uh, can you take Megan's, sure. please? Megan writes, hi, Vincent. I think the Infections of Leisure sounds awesome. Am I number 17? I haven't been emailing because I was certain someone would beat me to it. I had the great fortune of being on TWIV 333 at Vanderbilt and continue to be a dedicated listener, even as I have moved to the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh for my residency in pediatrics. I'd love a copy of that text. I remember, How could you turn her down? I remember, it wasn't the 17th, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, Megan, I remember, and she, I know that her boss moved to Pittsburgh. That's why she moved as uh -huh. well. Yep. And Kathy. Betsy writes, unfinished sonnet for a book contest. And there's an asterisk, but I don't know what that refers to. Oh, but at the bottom, underneath uh, Betsy. Oh, I see. Okay, so here's the sonnet. Seattle's overcast and dark these days. The high has been about five this whole dark week. And yes, the five is temp in centigrade. The gloomy weather makes me want to seek greater knowledge in virology. To understand just what my brother does, he researches that pesky HIV but I don't always understand because I haven't taken science since the aughts. And since return to such was not predicted until revisiting with TWIV, I've not applied myself. But now I'm quite infected, addicted. And nothing would give me as much pleasure as reading about infections of leisure. That's the same. Oh, and the, oh, okay, I see. So it says, hi, twivering Aspens. I'm Betsy <laughs> writing in for the book. Am I too late to win? Thank you for the podcast. I've been listening for a while now, on the bus or at work, and I think I'm learning a lot. My phone is littered <laughs> with open tabs from Googling things throughout the podcast. Anyway, thanks a lot for all your work. I always look forward to the next edition. Peace, Betsy. And so then here's the asterisk. I would have worked out the kinks in the sonnet, but I was afraid I was running out of time. <laughs> Feel free to read wasn't as a single indistinguishable syllable to navigate line 10 or make any other edits you see fit. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> I love when people type ha ha ha. Where is that wasn't? Line 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, uh, uh, was not. Uh, and was, since return to such wasn't, wasn't predicted wasn't, or was not yeah. predicted. Yeah. One, yeah, one predicted. Yeah, it's very interesting. Lovely. All right. Let us do some. Dixon, what do we do now? Remind me. Picks. Ah, Dixon. Before you, yes. Before you do that, I want to suggest that. I spent a long time while we were reading Andy's letter looking for a picture of that module that plugged into the old scintillation counter that had the picture <laughs> of the tritium and the C14 mm -hmm. uh, curves. And I think if anybody can send us a picture of oh one of those, they my. should get a TWIV mug. Yeah, sure. How? Yeah. <laughs> so it's probably going to be somebody who has one of those really old scintillation counters <laughs> in their department somewhere. <laughs> and there's probably only going to be fossil people like me who know what I'm even talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yep, sure. There you go. 
if you have one, spillover chart. You have one, Dixon? No. You already have a mug anyway. Not, not, ju- not just the chart, but that, that thing that actually was in the scintillation counter. I found, a, I found a picture of, picture I just, of it. Yeah. I just remember how slowly the vials went down into the counter. I just yes. loved watching that. It, it was, was fantastic. Cool. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was cool. great stuff. Dixon, do you have a pick? I do. I do. Uh, it's actual fo- uh, uh, the time lapse um, telescope view of an exoplanetary system around a distant star. And when you play this video, you can actually see the planets moving around their sun. I I was astounded by this. I couldn't believe you could actually see fake. the planets. It's fake, Dixon. It's yeah. all faked. <laughs> it's fake science. It's fake science. It's been the era of fake science. It my my page is not loading. Is yours? Uh, anyone else is loading? I, it doesn't. It mine, was also the APOD for February first. So if you have astronomy picture of the day, you could go to the archive uh, and look at February first. Uh, so you're saying this is fake? No, no it's just not. kidding. <laughs> just, just kidding. Yanking your chain again. Yanking, yanking your chain again, which is not. I don't do it all that often. Don't yank uh, Dixon's chain, please. I it's likely to lose it. Don't worry, don't worry, Dixon. Thank you. So this is a distant solar system. It's crazy. Yes, you can see the the planets. Mm. I mean, that's. I see three planets going at four, maybe four. Yeah. There, are, you know, they come in and out of. It's uh, like it reminds me of the early drawings that Galileo <laughs> made when he first looked at Jupiter. How far away is this? This uh, is very, system, very. You know? Twenty astronomical units. So, so <laughs> <laughs> well, they, no, the scale the scale is twenty astronomical units. This yeah, is one hundred and twenty nine yeah, yeah. light years away. It's pretty. Oh, far. cool! Almost as as far as all the phages uh, end to end. <laughs> Two hundred million light years. You know, speaking of uh, planets, for the last week or so, there has been a wonderful view of Orion in the um, southern sky. Oh, it's gorgeous! I love it. You just see those three. Stars and then the, the the sword, you know. When I walk the dogs, I look up and I just yeah, I love it. Yep, I like Orion too. That's a good good uh, constellation. Thank you, Dixon. Alan, what do you have? I have um, not exactly a science pick, but it is certainly a nerdy pick. Um, <laughs> That's all I can. <laughs> this is um, uh, some some wonderful news, which is rare these days. But um, Neil Gaiman, uh, who's a a humorist and writer who you may or may not have heard of, but he's pretty well known in mm-hmm. certain circles. He is going to go ahead and make a TV miniseries of a book that he wrote with Terry Pratchett called Good Omens, <laughs> which is the funniest book that I've ever read. Oh, it is boy. Wow. absolutely hilarious. Um, it's about it's about the apocalypse, um, so it's <laughs> timely. And I highly recommend, if you haven't read the book, go pick it up on Amazon and read the book. And um, the uh, uh, the TV minis- miniseries, given that it's being put together by one of the authors of the book, sounds like a good possibility as well. Hmm. Yeah, I've heard a lot about Gaiman. He's a um, favorite of nerds. Yes. And uh, yeah, I actually heard him on a podcast as well. He's an interesting guy. But why what would I want to read something that's funny, though? <laughs> Um, to laugh? I, I laugh at Dixon all day. I don't need any more of that. No, no, this, is, this, this thing is it? a blast. It, you have a warped really, really sense really of humor. <laughs> this book is hilarious. Okay, I will do it, but I will get just, the Kindle just read version. It, just read it until you get through the part about the about the uh, typographical error in a printing of the Bible and decide if you want to continue. <laughs> and they're going to make a TV miniseries about this? They're going to make right? a TV miniseries about okay, this, uh, yes. Good. Excellent. All right, I will Kindle it tonight. And uh, check it out. Yeah. Kathy, what do you have? I have a link to a YouTube video from BrainCraft, which I think we've picked yeah, yeah, various yes. ones before. And it's how to cure earworms. <laughs> and the fun. short answer is that if you can finish the song in your head, then that might cure the earworm. But then she mentions the worst earworm of all, which I don't want don't to do mention. It. Don't do it. But it was at the New York World's Fair in 1964 in the Pepsi Pavilion. So <laughs> if you and know what song promoted, I mean. It was heavily promoted by Walt Disney. Right. I, I, um, know, I know that song. But I just remember our family coming out of that in 1964 saying, that was awful <laughs> because right. of the song. Anyway, that song doesn't really end, and so you're kind of stuck. But a friend of mine in Georgia figured out a little ditty that worked for her and it works for me. And the words are very simple. 
all bound round with a woolen string. And I'll now sing it for you. All bound round with a woolen string, all bound round with a woolen string, all bound round with a woolen string, all bound round with a woolen string. And you would think that that earworm then <laughs> might get stuck in your head. But, but we're but, the crowd. <laughs> but it, it doesn't get stuck in your head. Or if the other earworm comes back, you can also try it in a minor key. And I won't sing that for you. Maybe we'll do it in an Easter egg. But uh, <laughs> May I suggest plunging one ear into a liquid vat of mabendazole? <laughs> no, that's for a different kind of earworms. Right. <laughs> I mean, the kind that went into Spock's ear. And and if you're a minor crew member on uh, in a Star Trek movie, yeah, then, right, uh, right, 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 right. You too. The yeah. Revenge of Khan, Khan's Revenge, or yes. something like that. No. Wrath nice. of Khan. Cool. <laughs> yeah, this is a wonderful um, YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. It was picked before. I'm very. I, I was yeah. visiting it earlier today, and uh, yeah, she's good. She has so many subscribers. Yes, I'm so <laughs> jealous. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, well, good luck. Vincent, good. what's your pick? Exactly. I have a uh, a website called Outbreak News Today, uh, which I've been, um, I've, I've known about this for a long time. It's run by Robert Harriman, and it's basically summaries of viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic, all sorts of infections. And um, he also has an AM radio station, which I appear on every few months. It's in Clearwater, Florida, and last night he called me up, and it's really a funny experience because you call, you get the producer, and they, ah, I'll put you on hold, and then you hear the show, and then the guy, he's doing an ad or something, and then he comes in, and he, we now have media empire runner Vincent Racaniello, a professor <laughs> at Columbia, you know, and we talked for a half hour about hantaviruses, yellow fever outbreak, uh, Zika, et cetera. He's an interesting fellow. He's a microbiologist, and, and so he put together this website called Outbreak, news and i thought some of us uh, might like to see it so he he archives all of his uh, radio interviews as kind of podcasts uh there he talks to a lot of different people about various things and uh, i think he has a media empire actually he writes all of these things and uh does interviews and he supports it with advertising he also has t-shirts with viruses and parasites on them so outbreak news today this you know, looks really good. This would be helpful for my yeah. class when we're looking for virus in the news stories. Yeah, there's lots, uh, he basically combs the the news in all sorts of ways and, and puts summaries up there. It's really useful. Uh, we have a listener pick from Tom. He sends a photo of a child holding a protest sign purportedly taken at the January 21st Women's March in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and the poster reads, What do we want? Evidence based science. When do we want it? After peer review. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The smartest protester, purportedly. Yeah, it could be taken there. It's in a crowd with a lot of people with signs. Well, and the hats in the background. The pink hats. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that'll do it for TWIV. This is episode 427. You can find it at iTunes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. But most of you do listen on your smartphone. And uh, they are, there's, there are various apps that you can use to subscribe for free. And that's what everyone does. You know, when I started TWIV, it was all about web-based listening. And now it's changed because since then, smartphones have come out and everyone consumes it and other things on smartphones. Really interesting how it's changed. Uh, you can help us out uh, by going to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have various ways that you can help us financially, like Patreon, uh, Amazon Associates programs, etc. And why? Well, we do some traveling and we'd like to go together to do podcasts now and then yeah. also help us with our production costs and so forth. And of course, expand the universe of microbe TV, make yeah. more podcasts. I'm sorry to say that the uh, entomologist declined doing a insect podcast with me. So oh. we'll have to find someone else. Wow. Oh. Too bad. I really liked her. She was at the Field Museum in Chicago. Is yeah. that the name of it? Yeah. Yeah. And she said she was rather busy. Oh, she, she was good. Probably busy as a bee. It. Busy as a bee. <laughs> but I will. I will continue to search for. Well, we already know she has ants in her plants. <laughs> <laughs> Dixon De Palmier, uh, LivingRiver.org, and ParasitesWithoutBorders.org as well. Right. Yeah. Chickenella.org. 
Uh, thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Did you have a nice class today? I had a wonderful class. In fact, as a tag on what you were just saying, <clears throat> these are students that have no science background. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to get them to buy into the concept of creating a city based on ecological concepts. So I have to teach them some ecology. So I said, and how do we know all of this is true? Mm-hmm. Because we have evidence-based science to back us up. And then I told them what evidence-based science meant. You told them you could pass a law and just discount all the evidence. <laughs> well, they, they all were painfully aware that that's not the right approach. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Did you like doing a classic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> should definitely. We do, should we do one every few months? Sure. Yeah. Another classic that I would always teach is the Berkshire S1 nuclease mapping for yeah. adenovirus. That's a good one. Yep. We could do that one. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the sponsor of this show. Blue Apron. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. There's one more title I would like to add. What's that? You could say Blinded by the Light. Or they blinded me with science. Well, which one do you want? They the blinded me with science is best. Blinded me with science. <laughs> Why is that a uh, title for this episode? Oh, the, the light, the UV light. The UV light. They, so that's why the light one is better. They hit. Blinded by the light is a little better. Okay, blinded by the light. I do like one hit wonder. Um, yeah. I do like it was a Dirk and UV light. That's good too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was yeah. kind of partial to better to light one virus than curse the Dirk. <laughs> but, what's that from i don't get that it's an old old saying it's better to light one candle than to curse the to curse the darkness that's right curse <laughs> that's the dark. pretty good too yeah and i suppose nobody got uh pitch dirk you were likely to be eaten to be beaten by you you no i didn't get that what's it's that a, you never you never played zork nope no oh, okay no. so the, the first uh, and, personal computer adventure game oh uh, anyway <laughs> The uh, help me sure. help me P three C O. You're on my only hope. <laughs> I like P3CO. that P three C O. Of course, it has yeah. nothing to do with the episode, but right, no, right. It's a nice right. ring to it. All right, so I think it's either one hit wonder, uh, better to light one virus than curse the Dirk, or it was a Dirk and UV light. I I think it was a Dirk and UV light. It's just it was a Dirk yeah. UV light. Okay, yeah. okay. guys like that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. sold. All right. So you want to hear um, all bound round with a woolen string in in minor key. Sure. All bound sure. round with a woolen string, all bound round with a woolen string, all bound round with a woolen string, all bound round with a woolen string. Hey, that's that's new, guaranteed to get rid of nice. your earworm. That's our new <laughs> TWIV intro song. No! <laughs> <laughs> Ronald Jenkins, forget it. <laughs> no, it should be our outro song to get it out of people's ears. <laughs> right. <laughs>